Hallelujah. Now slap your neighbor and tell him this is your day. <laughs> it's your day to die. <laughs> Could you grab your swords, please? And turn to Isaiah 6. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 6. <laughs> Thank God Jesus isn't religious. So don't get religious. Get free. Because <laughs> where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, not religion. He never came to bring religion. He came to bring a kingdom. But we want to be about kingdom business. And in kingdom business, there are areas where there's ethics and there's moral standards according to the eternal kingdom. There's areas where we must cooperate with the eternal kingdom because there's a king, there's a governor, and there's citizens. And there's also a military in God's kingdom. And everybody who comes into God's kingdom has already been drafted into the military. So your calling, your first call is to battle, right? Your purpose is to destroy Satan's kingdom. And your destiny is to use the talents that God has given you to infiltrate the world system. Has everybody got it? That's what you're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. He didn't rescue us to just sit in a pew and keep it warm. Hello. He didn't just rescue us to have families. He, he didn't just rescue us because we were in financial problems or we had addictions or we were sick. That's not what he just, he rescued us to serve him. Or else we might as well just die and go home. There's a purpose why we're still alive on this realm. There's a reason. And one of the greatest things or the most devastating things is when we stand before him and he says, enter in my good and faithful servant because you did what I asked you to do. Or depart from me. I don't know you because you didn't do what I asked you to do. It's something that we must never let go of. We must always know that nobody escapes standing before him. Amen. See, you can have your own belief system, but it may not believe it might not be the right belief system. There's only one truth. And he is the king of all truth. And the fullness of truth has come and dwelt among us. And his name is Jesus the Christ. And he left his spirit of truth that we might know all truth. And in that, in this truth, there is a message. And that message is to be decreed. You are hearing a message today, not from a man sitting here in funny shorts or a ponytail. You are hearing a message from the Spirit of God. It's not of a man. It's from the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And one of the things that the Spirit always does, He speaks in three-dimensional terms. Past, present, and future. He always wants to warn you. He wants to share what the enemy wants to do. And he wants to prepare you to combat and battle. And if you're not in the battle, you become a casualty. Remember, the spirit always speaks in three dimensional. Past, present, and future. And it's our responsibility to interpret what he's saying that's why the Word of God is three-dimensional. People read it like a regular book. Anybody can teach somebody something out of a book, out of human precepts and standards. But there's a difference when the Spirit brings it to us because it's penetrating and it's life-changing. It's penetrating and it's life-changing. When the Spirit begins to speak to us, there's something that begins to happen in us, and it's like, I want to change. I want to get right with God. I want to please him. Unless our heart is so hardened that we reject anything he has to say. 
So I ask you today, surrender your heart to him and let him have his way in your life because on that last day you give up your last breath. There's no turning back. You'll be before him. And from that point is where you go. And who you serve when you die is where you go. In Isaiah chapter 6, in verse 1, would you read it with me? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. These were seraphim. And one cried to the other, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, when you get touched by God, everything else around you is unclean. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. See, he couldn't do that until he was cleansed. He had to be cleansed first. Then he had a desire. See, once the Lord touched him, once he was cleansed of his sin, of his iniquity, of the curses that he inherited, once he was cleansed and freed by the Spirit of God, he said, what do you want me to do? I'll go for you. The same thing happened to Saul who became Paul. He was a man who was religious, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he was out with authority from the rest of the Pharisees to take in captive in prison all those who were of the way of Christ Jesus. He was a religious man. He thought he was doing the things of God, but he was doing the things of the devil. And every area of the enemy, he served him. And while he was on the road to Damascus to capture more, because you know what they were doing with these people? They were killing them. They were killing believers. Supposed to be men of God that were killing believers. Because they were religious and really did not know the truth. They became traditional. Traditions of men started their own belief systems. Caused them to perceive incorrectly. I say again, there's only one truth. And the Lord had to slam him, stop him on his way to Damascus because he was going to destroy more believers. And he visited him, blinded him. And Saul said to him, who are you, Lord? Obviously, he acknowledged him as Lord. And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. And he said to him, what do you want me to do? See, when Saul was touched, he said, what do you want me to do? It only takes one touch of truth to change you. We can't change ourselves, But there must be a desire. There must be a seeking to want to change. You can't change. But just the desire to want to change comes from him. See, when you have a desire that you want to change, it's from the throne room of God who says it's time come. It's time come. But so many reject. They say, not now. Amen. Well, maybe when I 
get my house in order or maybe when I get this job or maybe when or maybe and then they die and go to hell instead of getting taking that opportunity to change and one touch will give you a desire to change and you'll say send me teach me show me I'm yours and this is what happened to Isaiah is everybody okay in verse 8 again, and also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. Go tell them. Who keep on hearing but do not understand. Who keep on seeing but do not perceive. And make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. And shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be what? Healed and be healed. All oh, powerful. See, what happened here was a divine intervention from God Almighty. And in this divine intervention, which is a visitation, it brought forth a divine message to produce a divine messenger. How many of y'all want to be a divine messenger? Hallelujah. Go to Matthew 10. Divine messenger. Man, we need a, we need a bunch of divine messengers right now. And every corner and every store. In every place where we need to have divine messengers carry the divine message. People willing to give up their lives to carry a divine message. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse 16, Jesus said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. <laughs> in the midst of what? Wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks where? In you. But you got to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So that the spirit of God can speak through you. See, so many times fear prevents an individual from going forward or being sent. There's an area where fear always tries to negate what God is trying to do. And fear always brings you to you. Because fear causes an individual to rely on their own talents and their own abilities, their intellect. Fear is the guillotine of faith. Fear. People say, I don't have fear, but I ain't doing that. But they don't realize they have fear. <laughs> Most people don't know that they're fighting fear every single day of their life. And every decision you make, you're fighting fear. <laughs> Anything God asks you to do, fear is always... You know how many people will not raise their hands because of fear? You know how many people will not worship God because of fear? You know how many people go into a place and the Lord says, tell them about me. No way, not me, send somebody else. I'll pray that somebody else go. Because of fear. Fear. Fear, fear nullifies. Fear promotes death. Fear protects pride. And pride is the personal reverence into a deadly end. The Bible says pride goes before a fall. But I'm telling you, when you are empowered by the Spirit of God and you are filled with the Spirit and you have decided that you're dead, 
So you can't kill somebody that's already dead. You're dead to self. Then there's no more fear. It doesn't mean that you won't be attacked by fear, but it means you'll have dominion over it. Because you're no longer fighting for your life. You're fighting for the presence of God. And you're a divine messenger. Because you know you're going to stand before God and you're going to give account for submission or rejection. And in this, Jesus said, listen, I send you out into a mist of wolves, but don't worry, I'm with you. It's okay. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's all right. And don't worry what you have to, listen, you don't have to study what you're going to speak. Because <laughs> when you get there, I'm going to speak through you, so just get out of the way. Don't try and calculate it out. Don't try and intellectualize me. Just surrender to me. And I'll speak to you what needs to be spoken. And I'll reveal to you their hearts. That they may bow down and come to repentance and worship me and give me their life. And then I'll use them as a sign and wonder also as I'm using you and as a divine messenger. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit is a divine communicator or messenger that Jesus will send at the Feast of Pentecost. And the Feast of Pentecost, Jesus fulfilled. From that point on, the Holy Spirit has been being poured out. And now that the Holy Spirit is baptizing, Jesus is baptizing his people in the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ is now the divine messenger. But not everybody in the, the body of Christ is a divine messenger because they're still refusing to yield. If everyone performs their duty and cooperates with the training to carry his message, they will be known as the divine messenger. Turn to Malachi 3. Malachi chapter 3. And verse 1. Is everybody there? Divine messenger. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So what's a divine messenger do? Prepares the way before the Lord. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Now we are called divine messengers and messengers of the covenant. So that people come in covenant with the eternal one. In whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a laundry or soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord the offerings in what? In righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, idolaters, against perjurers, and those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien because they did not fear me, says the Lord of hosts, because they did not what? Fear him. Fear. This word fear is not terror. This word fear means reverence, honor, and respect. You know, you can't reverence and honor and respect somebody you don't know. Does everybody understand that? The only fear that people have of God is what he's going to do to them. <laughs> oh, my God. That's the, that's the fear of the carnal world. That's carnality. The, the world, many people fear God in the area of his judgments and his wrath. And there's nothing wrong with that. Hopefully it gets you into a relationship. But there is a fear that's in fellowship with the Lord, and that's the fear of reverence, honor, and respect. That is the fear of the Lord, because that fear of the Lord will turn you away from evil. 
because you love him. It turns you away from evil. You want to stay changing always in his image and likeness. You want to please him because you maintain the fear of the Lord. Now, we know that John the Baptist was known as a forerunner of the return of the Lord. He was one of the messengers that Malachi was talking about. And the Bible says that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Now, Elijah is going to be one of the two witnesses who's going to be here during Revelation time. Is everybody with me? But I want you to know that Elijah is also here in spirit through the anointing of Jesus Christ. Because Elijah represents the anointing. And the Lord says that I'm going to come first by my spirit before I physically come. So that means he's going to come through the body of Christ first as the divine messenger, as a forerunner of the return of the Lord. And then he will come. Amen? Is everybody okay? <laughs> Okay, Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. And verse 16. Jeremiah 23 and verse 16. Is everybody there? Let's read it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you to make you what? Worthless. Worthless. The Bible tells us that many false prophets will come in the latter days. And believe me, they are. They are in congregations. Some of them are pastors. Some of them are evangelists. All kinds. The word prophet here means that individual speaking out of the deception of their soul or the dictates of their own hearts, not according to the will of God or the Spirit of God. He said, they will speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. They will continue to say to those who despise me, the Lord has said you shall have what? Isn't what the government's trying to do now? Isn't what the global... I mean, everything globally is saying, yes, we're going to have peace. No, there's never going to be peace. You might have peace, but there won't be peace on this earth until the Prince of Peace comes. But there'll be a false peace. See, there are many who are rising up right now, saying that everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be fine. Man, I talk to a lot of people. Oh, the economy's going to come back and everything's just going to be fine. The houses will get right back to what they used to be. Sorry. Idiot. Dumb. Stupid. They are deceived and delusionized. They know not the spirit of God. They only know carnality. They rely on their own ability and strengths and their own bank accounts. They have no idea that the return of the Lord is near and that destruction is around the corner. And it's our responsibility as divine messengers to prepare the way of the Lord and prepare people for His coming. Amen? Praise God. <laughs> and to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, no evil shall come upon you. It's okay. Go ahead, go out and fornicate. You'll be okay. Go ahead and keep lying. You're all right. Jesus loves you. Hello? It's okay. Keep using dope. Jesus loves you. He'll fix you. It's okay. Just keep doing those things. You'll be okay. Gucci goo. <laughs> See, they want to comfort you soulishly. Because the demons in them know that if you stay in that state when you die, you go to hell. Are you listening? This is a strange message. Amen. It's from a divine messenger. 
and verse 18. For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and heard his word, who has marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. Are we in the latter days? Well, it's time to understand it perfectly. How are you going to understand it perfectly? By the Spirit of the Lord. Has everybody got it? By who? The Spirit of the Lord, who is known as the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit. False prophets. That are here now, they're lying. They're deceiving spirits. They speak peace. They lie. They are doctrines of demons. They have no understanding. And 1 Timothy chapter 4. Remember he said in, in the latter days they will understand perfectly. Listen, you're not here in the park to catch a tan. Hello. Now, you can do that after you get the divine message. <laughs> You're not here in the park just to get something to eat. You're here in the park because God divinely placed you here for this specific message, which makes you now accountable. He won't forget it, and I hope neither will you. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And it won't matter if you leave now, so you might as well stay for the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> For some of you who are thinking, maybe I better leave now. <laughs> Sorry, it's too late. <laughs> Hallelujah. First Timothy chapter 4 in verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly what? Says that in their latter times... Some will depart from the faith. In other words, they are going to fall out of walking correctly with God. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and what? Doctrines of demons. Hello. How much more clear do we need that? Many are who decided to walk right with God are going to change. Because they might have gotten offended. Or they're trying to promote their own desires and find a group of individuals that will agree with what they're doing. See, you can go to many places. There's probably places around here somewhere. There's some congregation or something that will agree with what you want. You know, but the end result is still the same. The end result doesn't change no matter where you go. Only who you follow is what's going to Cause the end result. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2. That's why the word says they will heap up for themselves teachers that will agree with what they want. Second Timothy chapter 2. I get many people to come to me and say, Pastor, uh, can you pray about this? I'm thinking about marrying somebody. All right, you sure you want my input on this? <laughs> I'll pray about it. And they won't come back for the answer. <laughs> They've already gone to another congregation and got married. Because they know what the answer was already before they even asked. <laughs> See, they already knew it in the Spirit. The Spirit already let them know ahead of time. But they want me to agree with it. And I'm not going to. Unless the Lord says so. Hello. 2 Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> and verse 21. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, 
sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now, wait a minute. It says, therefore, if anyone does what? Amen. Cleanses himself from the what? Ladder. ladder. This is not a ladder you climb up on a building, okay? This is from your past life. Anyone willing to cleanse himself from their past life and get a new life. That's how you start. That's how the process begins to become a divine messenger. First, you've got to put on a divine nature. And you must allow the divine power to work through you. And that's where his image and likeness. I'm telling you, I've been to places where people are saying, I'm a Christian. And I'm telling you, what? It, blew my, it blows my mind. I'll be there and I'm going, whoa. What part do they not understand what Christianity means? It means Christ-like. And I'm telling you, I've been in places where people are not Christ-like who are saying they're Christians. And it's like, man, what's, what part do you not understand what means Christian, Christ-like, not demon-like, not world-like, not the ways of the world, not to live according to the deceptions of darkness, not to live as idolaters and, and having idols. What part of Christ-like did they not understand? And, of course, I realized that first question I usually ask is, where do you fellowship? And then when they tell me, I realize why they're acting the way they do. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's conviction. Conviction. Whoops, I better get things right. You know, I've been ignoring this thing, you know, because you know, see, the Holy Spirit always brings those hidden things up and puts them in front of your face. And he says, quit looking at everybody else's stuff and look at yours. Look at your stuff. Don't judge nobody else. Judge your own stuff. Who's in your mirror? Hallelujah. So the first process of this, he says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter or his past, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, and prepared for every good work. Then he says, Flee youthful lusts, <laughs> but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a what? And what is he saying? Get in fellowship to those who are walking right. Quit hanging around. With the boozers, the addicts, the liars, the thieves. Quit hanging around with people that are not right with God. You'll end up like them. But avoid foolish and arrogant disputes knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord or a divine messenger must not quarrel but be gentle to all able to teach. Patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Now listen, you can't go around correcting someone if you ain't doing it yourself. How can you tell somebody something and accuse somebody of something when you're still doing it? You got no right. Amen? Praise God. So the process of maintaining the presence of God is to maintain cleanliness. Who can come to the holy mountain of God? Who can stand before the Lord? But he has a pure heart and clean hands. A pure heart and clean hands. So in this, we want to cleanse our past. We want to cleanse, get things. That's why Jesus said, come and learn from me. If you're not learning, you're burning. Hello? The process of maintaining the presence of the anointing of God is important. And it doesn't come without clean hands and a pure heart. We are to keep ourselves. We're to keep ourselves clean, unspotted from the world, uncontaminated from what the world offers. Because the world always brings dullness. It brings blindness. And one of the things that we need is clarity. Everyone say clarity. Sensitivity and conviction. 
Those are the areas that will constantly keep us. Why? Because in the presence of God, you will maintain clarity. You'll maintain clarity in the presence of God. If you get contaminated by the world, the first thing that begins to happen is your senses get dulled to the things of God. You're no longer sensitive. Your heart becomes hardened. And you go about doing the things in self-fulfillment of what you can accomplish instead of what God has already accomplished. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. See, because if you don't have sensitivity or clarity, you're not going to speak the correct message. You're not going to hear the correct message. In 1 John chapter 5, in verse 18, 518. Let's read this together, okay? 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. And we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. That word sin means fellowship with the presence of evil. But he who has been born of God does what? Keeps himself. How many of y'all know that you can fall from the state of being born again? Amen. And the wicked one does what? Does not touch him. Oh, hallelujah. So that's the whole area here. Now check this out. So if you're maintaining that pure heart and clean hands, is the wicked one going to touch you? No, you're going to have dominion, aren't you? It doesn't mean he isn't going to tempt you. It doesn't mean he's not going to try to sway you. Of course, he's going to try to prevent you from worshiping God. He's going to get your eyes on you and the woe is me syndrome. He's going to do everything he can to misdirect your focus. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the what? Wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Oh, yes. Keep yourself from the presence of evil. But keep yourself in the presence of God. In Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. In verse 8. Divine messenger. Romans 10, 8. Let's read it. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes un unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now the word believe means to follow. Does everybody got it? Follow. So you're not going to just sit there and say, oh, I believe the Lord and go out and serve the devil. That means you don't believe the Lord means you say you believe, but in your heart you're not. A believer, the word believe means to follow. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. 
But I say, did Isaiah not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation, and I'll move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Isaiah, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So in other words, without divine messengers, who's going to know? How can we turn our face away from becoming a divine messenger? How can we turn our back to God to fulfill the desires of the flesh and deny the desire to be a divine messenger? See, that's what your fight is every single day. When you wake up in the morning, the voice of the stranger meets you and tells you all kinds of things you need to do. He meets you with a list. But I'm telling you, God meets you also. And he says, come. Come pray with me. Come. Let me impart you my desires. You know, because you've been sleeping all night with the flesh. <laughs> now come. Come into my presence and let that flesh be mortified and crucified. That my image and likeness and character will be expressed through you. But it has to start. So you must sow Every morning into the spirit, not in the flesh. Because what you sow is what you reap. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 17. Is everybody there? Let's read this together. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are what? Perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise and where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Now I have much more, but I'm told not to go any further. We will continue this Tuesday and however the Lord desires to bring it. But I share with you today if Jesus Christ truly is only your Savior and not your Lord, come into the presence of God and ask to empower you with the Holy Spirit that he can become your Lord. See, he becomes your Lord when you no longer rule your life. He does. People use Jesus as only a Savior to rescue them from hell. But I'm telling you, there is a place where he is the Lord over your life. 
And he's looking for those who are willing to allow him to be Lord over their life. So when you accept Jesus as a Savior, I encourage you to give him your life so that he is Lord. Lord. Lord over your life. Lord over your decision. Lord over your finances. Lord over your relationships. Lord over everything. Lord over your breath. Lord over everything of your life. And I tell you, you will prosper in spirit, soul, and body. And you will prosper financially when he truly becomes your Lord. And his divine nature will take prominence. His divine character and the divine power will flow through you. And you will be a carrier of a divine message. And at any moment, at any point of time of your life, wherever you may be, he will stay, step aside and let me speak through you. Because I have a divine message for someone or many. Become a divine messenger and let him have his way as he becomes Lord over your life. Can everybody agree with that? Then everybody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Oh, hallelujah. Again, we ask for your forgiveness. Prepare our hearts for communion. And in anywhere where we've carried a carnal message instead of a divine message, we ask for your forgiveness. Lord, set us straight and position us to where it's no longer we that live, but you that live. And establish your kingdom in us and through us with divine nature, divine power, divine character, and the divine message that others may know you and behold your glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Hallelujah.